Uh, yay, my stuff's on screen. Uh, thank you for taking your time out from hacking. Thank you for coming. Um, I want to talk today a bit about pixels and the hidden meaning of pixels. And I've been spending a lot of time using pixels. As you can see, I used to work in the demo scene on Commodore 64 and wrote games and Amiga games later on. And then the web came around and I became a web developer, which is much more fun. So I'm Chris Heilman. I'm code poet on Twitter. Uh, if you don't have enough pictures of, of hedgehogs and kittens and you don't have enough about JavaScript in your, in your tweet feed, that's a good thing to follow. Also, I will answer questions there if you have some. But if you shout later, I'll be here for a few more hours as well. I'm a project manager, in, uh, a product manager in Microsoft. And in Microsoft, I work on open source things. So I came from Mozilla and came to Microsoft. And in my job interview, they asked me, what do you want to do here? And I said, kill Internet Explorer. And they said, yes, please do that. And you can start working on that. And I'm happy that we managed to do that more or less. Now, let me quickly remind you about something that we're talking about here. We all know this character, right? If you know him in green, then you probably have a bigger brother or sister, because you always had to be the second player. This is Mario. And the cool thing about Mario is not that it's a, that it's a great game, but that every single pixel there makes sense. There's not a single pixel there that is there for no reason because the hardware was so terrible and so low level that we had to fight for every single byte to do something with it. So when you look at it, for example, the red and the blue of what, he, what he's wearing and the jacket and the thing is so you can see the face and you can see the background. So otherwise the character would not be visible on screen because we always get very nostalgic about pixels nowadays. Back when we built these things, we wanted to make sure you couldn't see pixels. So we didn't watch that on cool LCD screens that were perfect. We had it on television sets that were smearing everything. So you had to make sure that the character looked good in front of the background and it was visible. And the background was, of course, light blue. And there was the, the sky. And there were, the, uh, were also the, 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 the bushes. And if you actually looked at that, the bush and, this, and the, the, uh, the, the sky, the clouds, were exactly the same sprite. They were just turned around. And one time they were white, and one time they were green. So this is how much we tried to save when we wrote these games to make sure that we have, a best, uh, have, a, have the best use of the hardware. The cap is on Mario because we didn't have enough pixels to show hair. That's like you could show left, right, that was basically it. So when you fell down a hole, they originally wanted to have the, weight, the, 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 the hair falling down, but there weren't enough pixels. So like, okay, let's give him a cap. Okay, this guy now has an overall and a cap. What the hell is he? Oh, he's a plumber. Oh, cool. Pipes are easy to design as well, so we make the pipe game and stuff. At Donkey Kong, he wasn't a plumber yet. We didn't know what the hell Mario was. Just with Super Mario Brothers, he became a plumber. Also, it's Mario uh, and Luigi su are the Super Mario Brothers. This means his name is Mario Mario. That's kind of stupid, but what can you do? The large nose and the mustache was there to avoid a mouth and facial expressions because we didn't have enough pixels for that either. So we just gave it a big mustache, and then you didn't have to know if he's smiling or if he's angry or something like that. It was designed by limitations. We made sure that we got the last bit out of the computer that the thing was running on, and we made sure that the thing looked nice and cute and still worked, but didn't eat enough even eat memory up. Now, everything had its reason and its meaning. Every single pixel was there for a certain use case. Of course, nowadays, this feels kind of silly, because we've been moving away far, far away from pixels and, and monitors and computers. We had an evolution coming from computers to, uh, to laptops to mobile phones. Mobile phones are the main use case for computing nowadays. And the next users of your products will be on mobile devices. They will be on, maybe on chatbots even. They will maybe even be on VR headsets. They will not be on a desktop glued in front of your website and looking at it all the time. And the main thing about these mobile devices is that they are advanced technology. They have like quad core processors in there, really good graphics cards. The battery life is shit most of the time. That's the only thing. That's why we have extra battery packs with our phones. But we use them to explore our world and tell the world where we are with social media. There's a nice quote saying like, this is the generation that minute by minute reports doing absolutely nothing. Because every time we like selfie here, picture there, and these kind of things. So,
pixels are a side product of our interactions with the web. Most of the stuff that's going on right now is with cameras or even with video cameras or with movement with VR things. People put a lot of images on the web and that way we made the web really slow and we made the web really overloaded for people who are on a slower connection or like me right now tethering and have to pay for a lot of stuff. The average website is 2.2 is megabyte and 1.4 megabyte of that is images. And the question is, why is that so much? Why are these images so huge? Because in essence, we have great tooling there. And I want to go through the first half of my talk about tools about what you can make to make your websites faster and your products on the web faster. And then I go into something more interesting, so I've got to be fast in the next few slides. I call it inspirational obesity. We have far too many things on the web that are far too big because we like seeing them there. We have these machines that have retina displays and are fast and have lots of memory. And that way we think, okay, this 6,000 pixel, uh, pixel picture, that's exactly what everybody wants to see. 1.4 megabyte of images. We're using the wrong file formats and we're delivering scaled high-res images to everybody. The amount of time I see a PNG image that is a photo that is 4,000 pixels wide, that's just stupid. PNG does not uh, compress well when something is an image. JPEG is much better at that. And when I see text that is saved as a JPEG, I want to scream as well, because that's what PNG or what, uh, uh, what GIF is for. We also have no automatic conversion and optimization steps. So instead, we try to optimize and then upload. And then when we give it to somebody else, a content management system or a blogger, we don't even look at it anymore. We don't convert the image before we upload it. We just upload it and hope everything is fine. And of course, every single blog post nowadays is a massive photo and then a bit of text. And I remember when the text was the most important thing, because then I can translate it into Portuguese or English or French or whatever I want to. With an image, I cannot do that unless you do something and you can do that. So we need to change that to make the web fast again, because the next users of the web are not here. They're not in countries with good connectivity. They don't even know where a wireless connection is. Most of the people that come to the web in India, in Bangladesh, in Africa, the growing markets where the next users are, are on mobile devices because there is no cables in the ground. There is not even internet connectivity. All they have is a mobile device and that's how they use the internet. It's even worse in Africa, for example, when I was there for Mozilla, when I worked for them, um, there's Facebook phones. There's not even smartphones, there's phones that only have Facebook on them because Facebook pays for the traffic whereas all other web surfing or other things you do on that phone would cost you money. So people think Facebook is the internet, and that's terrible. We have to stop doing that. So one big thing is surgical solutions. That's like proxy browsers or like uh, uh, settings in, for example, Chrome Android, the turbo setting that automatically converts all the images for you into lower level formats and into lesser quality pictures. And that way the end users see something terrible, but at least it's fast downloading. This is nice, this is good for the end user, but it's terrible for us as developers because we don't have any insight in it. We don't know what's happening to our code. And when I look at proxy browsers, for example, like UC Browser or, or Puffin, it actually uh, takes my CSS and my JavaScript and minifies it and gzips it. So I, it could happen that my stuff doesn't work just because the proxy browser optimized it for me. So here's a few things you can do. The problems. We've got huge images for everybody. We send the same image to everybody out there, and that's a bad idea if I'm on a 320 pixel phone. We have unoptimized images. The images are in a format where they're not supposed to be in. We have no alternative content. So when the, when the, when the, the, the image doesn't load, the website doesn't do anything. People don't know what's going on there. We have no training or incentive to add content in CMS. Like people that, that maintain websites don't know about images, and that's why you get BMP images on the web. Or when you ask a client for a logo, you get a Word document with an image inside it, which makes no sense either. So what, what can we do about this? First of all, better browsers with responsive image support. Browsers are cool nowadays. Don't think about Internet Explorer as a browser anymore. Forget about that thing. We got Edge, we got Chrome, we got Firefox, we got Opera, we got Vivaldi, we got Brave. We've got 10,000 new browsers and all of them are really good in standards development. We have automated, automated lossless search. We have automated lossless image optimization tools. We've got file level access to images to extract metadata. We've got scripting solutions to offer alternative content. We have cloud services with machine learning APIs for intelligent resizing. And we got machine learning for tagging. 
So first of all, browsers with responsive image support. Instead of having one image that we send to all browsers, we now have something called a picture element. The picture element allows us to define several sizes of the same image, and the browser only loads the one that they need. We had that before with media queries as well in CSS. I wrote that in 2012. Uh, and the problem with that one was you had like a CSS saying like if the, bra if the site is at least 480 pixels, use that background image. If it's 1,000 pixels, use that. If it's 2,000, use that. The problem with the CSS parser was that it downloaded all the images and then only showed one of them. So in terms of what went over the wire, what people had to pay for, we didn't have any gain at all. So we needed something better for that, and that's the picture element. The picture element and source set is widely, uh, is widely supported by browsers. It actually works across all the browsers that you expect it to do. And all you have to do is say, like, here's my 10 images, and the browser automatically picks the right one to display on that device, on that resolution, with that speed and that pixel density. So that's great. If you want to get some information about this, there is a blog by, um, uh, by Jake Archibald, which has a really, really good inside view of what this all means. But if you don't want to understand it, just use it. It actually works. There's also a good demo on the, uh, on the Microsoft test page that we have, where we have a, um, an image, and it shows you how it lays out according to text with, de with live demos to copy and paste, and all the information how that works with responsive images according to different sizes. We have automated tools for lossless image optimization. Instead of having images that look terrible and are smaller, the images look the same. This is not changing the quality of the image. It just gets rid of all the shit that is in these images that nobody needs that Photoshop and other tools put in there. And it uses packing algorithms inside the image format itself to make them smaller. The greatest tool for that is called Image Optim. Uh, it's available for all platforms. Uh, I'm using a Mac here, but I'm, uh, it's on Windows as well and on, 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 on Linux. All it, do, it does, you take the pictures that you have on your, on your machine, you drag it over there, and it, and it optimizes it for you. So it uses PNG Crush, it uses Extended Opti PNG, JPEG Optim, all these algorithms under the hood for you to change these images and make them smaller. It doesn't put the images somewhere else. All you have to do is put the images in there, and it changes the files themselves. So before you upload lots and lots of photos, run them through image optimization. Your end users will be very, very happy about that. It's also available on the command line, so you can make that in a, in a grunt task or in a gulp task, and you can uh, optimize your images on the fly that way. Now, a lot of what image optimization does is take out EXIF data. EXIF data is, is data that is in every image itself in there. And you can see that when you go into Explorer or something and you look at the image, it says you all the dimensions and when it was taken and with, with which software. These are all the EXIF tags that are in the image formats themselves. And you can read them out with JavaScript or on the command line and do things with them. You can do really clever stuff with them. I used to work for Yahoo and in Flickr, we used to uh, use EXIF data because every EXIF JPEG that is saved in Photoshop has a, uh, a thumbnail inside the file. So instead of loading the whole image and resizing it and making a small image out of it, all you had to do is extract those bytes that were those thumbnails in, uh, and then you didn't have to, bur to burn down the machine that way. That code is available. I also wrote a, a, small, uh, a small code pen that show how, shows how to do that. And this is what that looks like. These are images, all of them are like 5 to 8 megabyte. And if I drag them into the browser and I start to upload them, you will see that they immediately show up. And then you see this little circular thing going on. So what we did there is we took the image, we took out the thumbnail, we showed the thumbnail, and we kept the file reader going to read the rest of the JPEG. So you can do that to do an interface that looks much slicker than something that was just going on like this. So in this case now it starts loading it and the little spinner is going. So you show your end user something while you're still getting the rest of the data. And that's much easier than taking the image and resizing it because on a mobile device that would mean you can fry eggs on it. It becomes really hot and uses a lot of battery. You can also remove EXIF data. I've done a website called removephotodata.com. Because uh, one thing that EXIF data has sometimes, it gives away more than you want to. You want to have a picture of you in your house, but you don't want people to know where your house is. But most cameras and most like out-of-the-box cameras have the data in there. So you can, uh, I built this little thing again, uh, image to map, 
where you can drag a photo on it and it shows you where on the planet it has been taken. And that can be very embarrassing, that can be very dangerous, so you use that remove photo data to get rid of that image. Or you do something with that in your hacks today. Now, fallback content is very important as well. Uh, instead of just making people wait for hours for an image, you can actually show them just a background color that will show the rest of the image. You can give them an impression of what the image will look like once it's fully loaded. Some file formats have that already in there. If you have, for example, a, a, a progressive JPEG, shows it a bit blurrier and then it becomes better. A, 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 a interlaced GIF shows every second line and then it fills in the other line. So the file formats themselves do that. But most of the time you want to script that. Medium, the blogging platform, does it like this. So you can see when you want to restart that now, you can see that the thing blurs and then the image shows up. And that's pretty cool because it gives people the impression and it already has the right size so you don't wait for the image to load while you're reading and then the text goes away and you're like, okay, I wanted to read that actually. This is what Medium has in their web page to make that happen and that is insane. I don't know what they're doing there, but there's lots and lots of stuff happening that is not necessary because there is a rather simple way of doing that, which is uh, explaining that URL up there and the slides will be available later on as well. So you can use a, uh, you can take the, the thumbnail image that I talked about from the JPEG, you can resize it with CSS to the background with background size 100% and put a CSS or SVG blur filter over it. And that way you have that blur effect and then the rest of the page loads in and you got it fine. You don't see the pixels, you just see the blur. You can also use Canvas uh, with, to analyze images itself. So in this case, you saw the pixel uh, logos earlier. I made this logo generator with like old Commodore 64 fonts. And this one shows you the image here and the different colors that have been used. 1,472 pixels black and then the other three colors which are less of those. For a canvas element in, uh, in HTML5, every image is an array of pixels. It's just an object that says width and height, and then it's an array of the pixels with RGBA value. So you can do really cool stuff with that. You can like uh, change colors around, you can cycle colors, you can find out where, where edges are in images and so on and so forth. The code for that looks something like this. It's not that tough, it's just a lot of like shifting around of, uh, um, of canvas data. I don't want to do that live because it's rather old school by now, but it's good fun to play with if you have no, if you've got nothing to do right now. Okay, Colorify.js is a JavaScript that does that automatically for you, so it creates these gradient backgrounds for images, which is pretty cool, but don't do that when you're just scrolling it on a mobile phone because that makes it slow again. So a simple background color makes much more sense that way. There's also one called Color Thief, which has a really nice interface to show you how that's done. So if you uh, click on that one, it analyzes the image in the background, and then it gives you the dominant color of the image and the palette of the image. And this is just a JavaScript library you can use for that in your content management systems, or also to change the look and feel of the website around the image to fit the image. Now, let's go to the interesting bits. Machine learning and images is something that I've been working on for quite a while now. And we have a whole set of data uh, uh, APIs to play with. And there is actually a, ch a challenge here. If you want to build AI stuff, use these APIs, build bots with them, build something there. On the website, you get all the information. I just got an email that I should tell you that, and they tell me I don't get a hotel room and no food until I tell that. So please do something with these APIs and do a nice hack so I get, money, I, I get somewhere to sleep. Now, what can you see here? This is one of these interesting things that seem simple once you know what's going on, but are so much more powerful. Like if I uploaded that image somewhere and I want to show a smaller version of that image. This one up there is not really making any sense because half the woman is missing. If I resize the whole image, I would basically have blocks on the top and the bottom and something blurry that might be a woman or might be whatever. In the middle one, it seems a bit better. And the third one, I've got only the most important part of the image to become the resizing thing. So how did we do that? In the first one, you just cut it normally, and that was, a, that was a stupid idea. In the second one, the image is centered on the face of the lady. So we detect the face in that image and center it in that one. In the third one, we did an outline algorithm. We found the heavy outlines in the tool. And instead of the straight line, there were no other ones. And then we realized this is the woman that is the most important part of that image. 
That one is available as a JavaScript as well called SmartCrop.js. If you want to look under the hood and actually see what kind of, in an algorithmic fashion, and in this case using Canvas, how that can be done. But it's very heavy on the machine. So on a mobile device, doing that on a live image, not necessarily a good idea. On a desktop, in a build script, go for it. It's absolutely cool. Then we also have services like Cloudinary, which is a company in Israel, and they, uh, they use our uh, Microsoft Cognitive Services under the hood for their stuff. So they do image, video, uh, image stabilization, video, uh, video stabilization, smart cropping, and instead of you having to know any JavaScript or something like that, well, they have Ruby, Python, PHP, Node.js, Java, jQuery, and so on, SDKs, but it's actually a URL. So in this case, you have an image here called on the phone JPEG, and this stopped working on the phone JPEG, and it says, go to cloudinary.com, the image upload, and then give me the uh, fill of the whole of the screen that we have, give it a 16 by 9 ratio, and a width of 640. So in the URL parameters, you can define what the image should look like without having to use any API or something like that. And that's pretty powerful when you can do with that, because you can do intelligent resizing. So if the browser resizes, the image will always fill up the whole browser width, and show you the most important part of the image rather than like only the top or only the bottom. But it, it wouldn't stretch it or make it look stupid because it just keeps the ratio all the time as well. And on the, uh, on the, right, on the right hand side, you can see that these thumbnails become the most important part of the image and then the le lesser important but use up the space better. So again, that the mobile phone is, is totally filled up. And you can see that text also shows up only when the, when the phone is big enough and you want information to read it. ImageX is another uh, company that does something like that as well. And what it does, it uses high contrast versions of the images. So if you want to do something like that in a hack, uh, it's always a good idea to, to take your image and simplify it in terms of colors. A 16 color grayscale image is much easier to find the outlines than an, uh, than an image that is full color because the algorithm of, uh, of changing the colors already mushes the colors together. So you find the outlines much easier. So in this case, you can see the coffee table here with the coffee mug and the, uh, uh, and the table. And you realize these are the outlines. The other one's not so interesting. The same with the lizard. That lizard doesn't work with normal facial algorithms to detect what, faces be, uh, what the face is. But as we realize, this is where most of the head is and the arm. Good, that's the most important part of that image. So what about information that is not in the image? This is all still looking at the data of the pixels and converting the image a bit and doing something with it. It's not really yet cl uh, clever magic with data and images. Machine learning and artificial intelligence is, comes to the rescue there. It's absolutely amazing what we can do nowadays with machine learning and artificial intelligence when it comes to images. I, I just gave a talk about machine learning and what it means for a job market and who's going to be out of work soon and what, how, how self-driving cars work and these kind of things. In essence, there's two things. Computers are good at what people are bad at and people are better than computers when they're emotional or when it needs creative thinking or when it needs an analyzing of things that is not connected with numbers and algorithms. And machine learning and artificial intelligence only works when we got lots and lots and lots and lots of data. And that's why all the image algorithms out there that you can use that artificial intelligence systems are from companies like Microsoft, Facebook, Google. It's not that those are evil corporations that, that, that basically want to have robots that take over the world. It's just that we have all the data. And we trained that data for years and years and that computers look at them. For example, Facebook has these alternative texts on their images. So this is a friend of mine uploaded her dog photo and it said image may contain dog, outdoor, and nature. That's nothing that she entered. It's, it's not in the page. It's not in the upload. It's just that the uh, Facebook automatically detected that there is a dog, there's outdoor and nature in there. And that's the alternative uh, attribute on this image in Facebook itself. So how does that work? They released, uh, uh, they released a library and they released a data set to actually show you how it's done. And that's what, that's what I found cool. They've been doing it for eight to 10 years now, and they've been analyzing all these images, but now the pressure is on that all the companies have to make you look under the hood and see how these things work. So uh, in this post down there, they explain how it actually works that they do these images. So you classify, you say, I want a person, a sheep, or a dog. Then you detect them, the outlines most of the time, and then you start segmenting them, and then you have a segmented part of pixels that you can compare with other images. 
So they have a good picture of a sheep that somebody entered in or already put the metadata on there and then they compare the outlines and the pixels of other images. Is this also a sheep? Is this a zebra? Is this a bus? And so on and so forth. So Facebook knows what's in your photos. So if you think it's clever not to give a description and think you're selfie where you're half naked, drunk somewhere in a corner at a party, Facebook knows. Don't worry about that. They already know. So making photos findable is why we did that. This is Google, uh, this is Google Photos. And if you enter in Google Photos, it already realizes, for example, what are selfies. I never described any of these photos as a selfie, but it shows this orange hairy thing in the middle of the screen, so it probably was me holding up my camera and doing a selfie. Kind of embarrassing when you see how many selfies you take without realizing it. Then if you, I was in Tel Aviv, you enter Tel Aviv, and it doesn't only pick, find pictures that have the geolocation of Tel Aviv in them, but also the London ones where I was on the way to Tel Aviv. I have no idea how it did that. Probably timestamped together with my, where I was at the airport and so on and so forth. And then I started typing in German words, and I don't tag anything in German. So this is dog, and this is cat, and it finds pictures of cats. It also finds a picture of my family's dog, but he is actually a cat, that's why. So he acts like a cat, so that's why that's okay. But it's amazing that because as soon as we know the words, as soon as we have the tags, what an image means, like food in this case, uh, it just finds random food. How cool is that? Uh, we, we can now translate that as well because translation has been around for a long, long time and we've done that as one of the first search results uh, uh, for, for artificial intelligence. Now, we have data sets that we can play with that are downloadable. ImageNet.org is one of those that has shot lots and lots and lots and lots of tagged images and you can use them to compare with other images to know what's a cat and what's a dog. You can learn from lots of data. ImageNet.org has 9 million, uh, uh, ImageNet.org has 14 million pages. 14 million, yeah. And Google just opened uh, their data set of 9 million URLs to play with as well. So this is not ImageNet.org, that's a mistake up there. But you can download the metadata of the URL and the images, the annotations, and the high level image annotations as well. So that way, you have images already tagged that you can do something with and compare them with other images if you want to build something like Google Search yourself, which probably is not something that you can roll out in one hack day, but why not? So, for example, this first one here, which doesn't look like anything, is balcony, stairs, facade, iron door, interior design, gate, architecture, handrail, baluster, window, arch. Baluster. And this is because humans typed that in over the years. These are, these are words typed in by real humans that your machine can then compare against and understand if it's good enough as well. Whereas like a machine could easily say on the second one, this is like spoon and fork, but it's not cutlery, tableware, metal, tool, spoon and fork, and so on. There is a uh, TensorFlow is an open source engine from Google as well that you can use in your hacks. Uh, it's, it's much, much simpler to use than something like IBM Watson, which costs a lot of money. It's not as simple to use as our APIs, but it's pretty cool because it has a really good Python API or even a Go API if you want to use that. Part of the Google Brain team. So that one allowed, that, that one explains how to use that data set that they just released to do automated captioning on images. So, for example, from the training set, we had a man riding a wave on top of a surfboard uh, three times in three different images. And that way, seeing that there is water, there's splashy things, there's a darker thing in the middle that looks like a human, this is probably a man riding a wave on a surfboard. See, it looks good because I can compare with all the others that already were validated by humans. Uh, you also have humans take captions from the training set and we can analyze them on a lexical level. So instead of analyzing the images, we now go through the text and we realize what is a noun, what is an attribute, what is a verb, and what is adjacent to something else. What does mean something is something next to something else? So using those, we can then form full sentences because you don't want to go to Facebook and get taught like dog, spoon, elephant. You want to see like dog and an elephant eating something. Okay, that's a shit demo. But you know what I mean. It's like you want to have a proper sentence rather than just like keywords thrown at you. This is not how we communicate as humans. 
And then you can even add visual information. Once you have the, uh, the automated tags and the inf image information, you go through the image information and say, for example, colors. So you got like brown bear is swimming in the water and actually it was two brown bears. So it says two brown bears sitting on top of rocks because we detected rocks as well. And then we have a train is sitting on the tracks. A blue and yellow train is sitting on the tracks. So that's easy to detect. All you have to do is compare the RGB values of each pixel, find the most, uh, uh, the most colors used, and then you can say it's blue and uh, yellow. Why does Google do that and where does it use it right now in Allo? That's coming out soon. Uh, 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 other messen uh, 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 Facebook Messenger, Skype, and WhatsApp, others do that as well. So what Google now does is as you upload an image, it gives you some tags to say like, hey, if you want to say something about it or if your friend sends you a picture, you want to say something about it, press that button because why should you be creative as a human when a computer can do it? I find this really cool technology, but I find it really depressing at the same time. I mean, at the end, we become a transportation device from computers talking to other computers. I think humans are better for that. But we kind of like, we're so lazy that we don't even want to type stuff in anymore. That's why we use these kind of things. Now, we've got an API uh, uh, based on that as well. And there is a captionbot.ai if you want to play with something. And this is what it does. You upload the picture and it says, I think it's a young man jumping in the air on a skateboard. See how clever we are. We say, I think. So in case it goes wrong, we can basically say, like, well, we thought wrong. You know, we're not saying that's a man on a skateboard and you'll be like, eh, you're wrong. It's amazing how many times we do that as humans, though. We, every time something goes wrong with machine learning, we're all happy about it. Because kind of psychologically, we still want to be better than computers. And every time you give somebody a, an iPhone with Siri, the first thing they try to do is ask Siri something it doesn't know to basically prove how oh, we're more intelligent. You know, it's like when one self-driving car breaks down on the road, it's like the end of innovation. When 20,000 people run each other off over in the street every day, that's not a problem, that's human error. It's like computer errors and, uh, and human errors, we, we actually deal differently with. It's quite interesting to see. Talking about humans, we can detect humans in, the, uh, in images. And we can detect them in several angles and several ways. I'm, I'm not online here because otherwise I would show you some really cool demos. Sounds like teasing, but you can talk to our Microsoft people here later on to look at mymustache.net where you can automatically detect mustaches in people and paint mustaches on them if they're not. Or whatbreed.net, which is like you can upload a picture of a dog and it tells you what breed that dog is. And of course, everybody uploads their own photos and see what kind of dog they would be. It's quite fun to see those things. Now, if you use the Cognitive Services API, which is a REST API, and it has, uh, it has SDKs in Node.js, SDKs in Python, SDKs, you don't need to use Microsoft technology. I don't, so it's all good. Uh, in this case, for example, I have this man in the water here swimming, and it tells me it's a 28-year-old man, and it's not adult content, and it's a category of people of swimming. And it gives you the dimension of the image. It says if it's clip art or not. It tells you if it's a black and white image. It tells you if it's racy or if it's adult content, which is really important to filter out images if you don't want to show them in the Emirates or something like that. We also have, uh, and that's a bit of a downer, but it's very, very important. We have an API that automatically detects child pornography and deletes it. So you actually had, don't have to look at it and report it to the police because most of the time the police will then take you in which is a self-fulfilling prophecy. That's why it doesn't get, get reported. So we, we're working together with Interpol to have a database of images that get automatically detected and deleted. So if you have a service where people can upload random images, use this API to protect the people using it and yourself. It's a really, really good idea, and it works together with the police. If I now upload, if I clicked on the lion here, it would tell me it's lion and clip art. If I, the city says cityscape, black and white image, buildings. So you get all kind of cool info in there. And the important part here is also detecting the faces. Because that way, in a second step, we now can detect faces and we give each of them an ID. So the first time you run it through the API, you get that ID back. And that way you can compare it then with a lot of other ones and can start finding people in other pictures, much like Facebook magically finds you in other photos without you realizing it. And we also use that for logging into the computer on a Surface Book, for example. I look into my camera instead of having to type my password every single time. And as the security level in Microsoft is really high, I have to do it sideways, front, and sideways again, so nobody can take a picture of mine and show it to the computer. It's also an interesting way of, of hacking these kind of systems. 
So we have emotion detection, which is really cool. We can basically see how much anger, contempt, disgust, fear, happiness, how neutral your face is, how much sadness and how much surprise is on each of these pictures and each of those faces. That's really cool to make like smile to log in or these kind of things. And it was fun working with these APIs because people had to show a lot of emotions in front of their computer all the time. In Portugal, not so much of a problem, but in, in Finland, for example, it always shows neutral no matter what you try. And this is really nice to automatically say, like, all my happy photos should go into that folder, all my sad photos should go into that folder. Or here's, uh, there's also a demo, again, if I were online, I would use it, where I can film the whole room, and uh, who's the happiest person can win a prize, because it actually does emotion detection on all, of the, on all of you. It's pretty amazing. Before you all go, go uh, hippie communist on me, I am one, so don't ask me about that. No, we don't keep your images. We give you the data back. These images are not going in some secret database where people print them out and look at them all day. We don't need that anymore. We got 17 trillion photos in Bing to compare against, so it's all good already. If you do illegal stuff on them, no, not even then, but don't do illegal stuff on photos. Just don't. So here's what it looks like, image uh, uh, detection attributes. You get the, uh, the face rectangle, like which, is which part of the picture is the face. You get the width and height of it, left and top in an image, so you can automatically paint uh, uh, something around it. And you get the, uh, the face landmarks, so you see how much, uh, where, the, where the pupils are, and you see the age that we guessed, and the gender that we guessed, and then the row, the yaw, and the pitch, which is like the two, three different ways you can move your head. So you can actually make something, you could use this to make a controller that people should shake their head to control something in 3D if you want to do that. Like simulate a VR headset with a camera, that's pretty awesome. Wow, shame I have to fly home. You can verify faces, once the face has been detected, you can detect it with another one and compare the two. And then you can say like, is it identical, yes or no? There's twinsornot.net is another website where you can upload two pictures and it shows you how much they are similar. It's like Pippi Longstocking in me is 17%. I, I, I tried that already. And uh, Mick Hucknell from Simply Red is sadly enough very, very high. And you can then cluster automatically. So you can take a, pic uh, take a whole set of pictures and it gives you a picture of all the elderly people, of all the women, of all the kids, of all the younger women, of all the people you know, of all the people you don't know. You can just run that as a script over a folder and not spend 16 hours in Photoshop doing it yourself. Now, I want to end with something that is really, really exciting, and it's a video, so that you can watch that with me. Um, and that is taking all this technology, not just to make cool technology, but to empower people. And this is something that I want you to think about. We're not using machine learning to make machines take our jobs away. We're using machine learning to make humans better. Self-driving cars are not there to actually take away the job of, of cab drivers. Self-driving cars are there to make you not have sit in a traffic jam for three and a half hours that has no reason. To not run into a car just because the other one breaks and you were too tired or you were not fast enough. We've got a service running with a few car companies where you have a camera in your car and it detects your emotion and how, how, uh, how bored you are and how distracted you are and automatically slows down the car. That kind of stuff is really, really interesting to see. So without further ado, look at this, because it blew my mind when I saw it, especially we showed it at the Build conference in, in San Francisco, our big ship conference where I just had to buy a ticket, I wasn't invited. And uh, out of a sudden I see this guy on stage who's a friend of mine and see what he's been doing. I hope that works. I'm Sakib Sheikh. I lost my sight when I was seven. And shortly after that, I went to a school for the blind. And that's where I was introduced to talking computers. And that really opened up a whole new world of opportunities. I joined Microsoft 10 years ago as a software engineer. I love making things which improve people's lives. And one of the things I've always dreamt of since I was at university was this idea of something that could tell you at any moment what's going on around you. I think it's a man jumping in the air doing a trick on a skateboard. I teamed up with like-minded engineers to make an app which lets you know who and what is around you. It's based on top of the Microsoft Intelligence APIs, which makes it so much easier to make this kind of thing. 
The app runs on smartphones, but also on the Pivot Head smart glasses. When you're talking to a bigger group, sometimes you can talk and talk and there's no response and you think, is everyone listening really well or are they half asleep? And you never know. I see two faces, 40 year old man with a beard looking surprised, 20 year old woman looking happy. The app can describe the general age and gender of the people around me and what their emotions are, which is incredible. One of the things that's most useful about the app is the ability to read out text. Hello, good afternoon. Here's your menu. Great, thank you. I can use the app on my phone to take a picture of the menu and it's going to guide me on how to take that correct photo. Move camera to the bottom right and away from the document. And then it'll recognize the text. Read me the headings. I see appetizers, salads, paninis, pizzas, pastas. Hi. Years ago, this was science fiction. I never thought it would be something that you could actually do, but artificial intelligence is improving at an ever faster rate, and I'm really excited to see where we can take hey. this. As engineers, we're always standing on the shoulders of giants, building on top of what went before. And in this case, we've taken years of research from Microsoft Research to pull this off. I think it's a young girl throwing an orange frisbee in the park. For me, it's about taking that far-off dream and building it one step at a time. I think this is just the beginning. It's amazing, isn't it? A blind man can see with software that he's written on a $200 headset. I've been at an accessibility conference and there was a, these, uh, a company as well that made a commercial version of that. Like It's, a, it's, a, it's glasses that can, um, all, it can, all it can do is basically detect people, so you can take a picture of my friend and it will find my friend again. It cannot tell me the age or normal things around me and it can detect uh, OCR scans so you can actually see a street name and read it out to me. And those were 2,700 euros, those glasses. This is open source. This is available with APIs that he built himself and he, he made himself see with these kind of APIs. And I find that so exciting, especially the little things, like the taking the camera, uh, taking, uh, it doesn't even need the glasses, you can do it on his mobile phone, it's going to come out on iOS, that app. And that it, it told him how to take the picture, because nobody thinks of that, like a blind person taking a picture is like, how would they know that the picture is straight? So we did edge detection on the, uh, on the, uh, on the menu to tell them like, oh, we need it straighter, and we'd be better for you. And that's the kind of little things that I wanted to think about. Take technology and make humans better, and there is a lot of cool machine learning APIs out there. Facebook's data is available. Facebook's APIs are available. Google's TensorFlow is available. Uh, in, in IBM Bluemix, you also get access to Watson to a degree. Uh, there's Amy.ai's data sets. There's many, many out there. And of course, there's the Microsoft Cognitive Services, and we have a competition here. So please play with this, and never forget that each picture tells a story, and now we can add stories to images with data from somewhere else, and that's pretty amazing. So thanks very much. If there's questions, just come up, I guess, because we don't have any roving mic or something like that. Oh, do we? Yes, we do. Okay. Wait for the mic. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hi, Chris. Yeah. So you showed us some awesome, amazing um, uses for narrow AI. Do you see... Uh, uses for wide AI and um, how do we, where do we stand on that? What's the current kind of... Uh, okay, I, I understood so every third narrow word. You, Can narrow we make it louder? Oh, oh. <laughs> more sound on the stage, yeah. Okay, so I'll try to scream. <laughs> okay, so awesome uses of narrow AI. Yeah. Um, how, what's, what's the... Um, the state of the art for wide AI and what kind of users in this field are being uh, thought about in, in the narrow, in the wide AI sense? In the wider AI sense, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, AI exists of several things. What I have here is the use cases when you already have the data set. What is interesting as well is writing training algorithms, writing segmentation algorithms, writing language analysis tools. We have a lot of systems. We have, for example, a, a list system called Lewis, 
which allows you to give it a text and then it actually, uh, uh, you define the, the, uh, the structure of your text or, or what you're looking for and then the system trains itself according to this. So these are the use cases that are more interesting as well if you dig at the wider field of it. For example, what we did with it, we had uh, uh, voice recognition of children and children are in unintelligible most of the time. So we, we had like a few hours of kids talking about their favorite books. And we didn't tell the computer what a book was uh, and what it was. And the, the, the transcription was bullshit. We didn't understand a single word of it. So, but then we told them it's about children's books. And we fed a database of children's books. And the thing became proper English. And you could start understanding it. So the, uh, uh, the data science part of it, I haven't covered because I don't know it. Uh, but there is a large, large world out there as well. Especially when it comes to hacking. There's a, I can't remember the URL now there. But there's a data set website where you can download data sets and they want you to build models for it and there's up to $250,000 for some of them. One of the, the, the main data one, if you want to look for it, just look for the Titanic, uh, uh, Titanic Survivors database. That is the demo set that they have where, where you have all the stubs of the people that went to the Titanic and you have to also ask them themselves and find the data and then detect who was likely to survive and so on and so forth. In terms of uh, the wider AI, that's more a political statement right now because it's like, where, do, where, where does it end in terms of eth uh, uh, where, where do the ethics come in? Who dotes the data? Who goes for the data? But uh, I can't cover that in, in here. But I gave talks about it. I'm really excited about it as well because I don't want my data to be... Uh, that's why I'm so excited that Facebook and Google and uh, us as well, that we give you access to that data. I don't mind being monitored if I already know what people know of me. It's like when people say, I don't mind when people know stuff of me because I don't have nothing to hide. That's, that's stupid because you have to defend yourself against the stories that are made up from your data, not really what happened. So I want to make sure what data is known of me and I want to get access to it. If a government gets my information, I as a citizen want also have access to that data. And that's something that we're fighting for a lot right now. One great thing is that Microsoft sued the American government and won that we don't, uh, they do, the NSA doesn't get access to servers in Europe. And I'm like... This is great. Anything else that I can answer properly? <laughs> Hi. Uh, when describing the images, um, is there a, prob a big problem translating to other languages? Because sometimes a certain words uh, means, means different things on, yes. on different images and descriptions. Yes. So the question was, uh, uh, when we describe images, uh, isn't there a problem with context? That sometimes a word means one thing in the image, but the image shows something else, even especially when you translate it. And that's where it gets important that we take what I showed you, the different colors, nouns, and verbs, and these kind of things, that instead of having only categories, we also make full human readable sentences out of them. Because translating them into another language is more likely to give a proper result and change the order of the words around accordingly to the syntax of the other language as well. Because, yeah, it can get very embarrassing, and uh, so there's lots of data where, uh, where um, because of translations, Facebook flagged up images as like racist that were like a baby with a rattle in their hand or something. So those mistakes were made and they actually, by, by making full sentences as also part of the metadata, we learned that this is a much better way to avoid that problem. Yeah. It's boiling up here, by the way. <laughs> Hello. Uh Question about image formats. Uh, if I recall correctly, can you scream? Because oh, they over there do. <laughs> okay. Uh, ping uh, as a file format uh, took a lo long time to catch up to become popular. Okay. Didn't, ping. Get, didn't get a word of that. I'm coming down. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Ping uh, the file format. The file image format. format. Yeah. Ping uh, took many years to catch up to become popular? PNG. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, PNG is the file format PNG popular. Kind of. Um, yeah, very much. Uh, especially when uh, on Macs, it's the file format that every screenshot is automatically saved in because it's an open source format and it's uh, gzipping inside the file system, so it has a lot of good benefits that way. Um, what is not as much supported is WebP yet, which is the Google image format, the, web app, the, the picture format of WebM, which is really, really good in terms of, uh, in terms of um, comp compression, but it's not supported by all browsers yet. So that's the next one. But PNG is a great format to use. Yeah, my question is, uh, do you see um, 
other file format, other image file formats catching up, or are JPEG just good enough for us? Well, JPEG is, runs on everything, and it's really easy to decrypt. Uh, more uh, compressing formats like WebP are also more uh, uh, dependent on the hardware. It could slow down your browser, it could slow down your phone. So um, I think for now we're stuck mostly with JPEG, GIF, and PNG. WebP is coming, and it's got to be supported by a lot of them as well. There was also JPEG 2000 and APNG, and there's all kinds of formats. It always depends on how tooling works as well. I mean, I can create a JPEG with almost anything. An APNG, I needed to use image magic on the command line to create it, and nobody who is not a hacker does do that. So. Yeah, but there is a, a new wave of uh, image formats like uh, FLIF and uh, Lepton that... Uh, so are you saying geeks invent new things all the time? No. No, <laughs> I'm saying that uh, on, uh, on one side, we have uh, greater compression yeah. and gr greater features. In the other side, we have a market that is not very fond of uh, applying new ideas. And uh, image size is growing up, but storage size is increasing. Yeah. Um, uh, network bandwidth is increasing. Uh, do you see that new f image formats are um, bringing uh, something, uh, satisfy a need that is existing? Yeah, the question or is... Or is things just good enough as they are? The que question is, uh, is, are a new image format a need? We, we, we were just discussing when we did picture element and source set if a container format wouldn't be better like uh, an ICO file, for example, 5icon.ico is a container file which has all the, the sizes in it and you only detect the part that you want and jump to that part, the bitstream. Turned out it was too complex to make it run on uh, backwards compatible with older browsers as well. With a JPEG, you can open that in Netscape 3 and it works. With a new format, you have a broken image and then you have to get a fallback image and these kind of things. Uh, in essence, what it falls down to is tooling. If it's not easy to create in Photoshop, people are not going to use it. So that's the biggest issue that we have. We can build as many tools as we want to. If the people who create images don't tune them in that format, then we have an issue. I mean, my Mac updates every two days with a new raw image format of like, uh, because of some camera came up with a new data format to get it into the operating system. But the optimization inside Photoshop itself is not working yet that way. And I'm looking forward to systems like Cloudinary and other cloud services to automatically convert and compress images to, for you into these new formats as well. So that would be one way of working around that issue. Because as you rightfully said, storage is cheap, but bandwidth is not. Cool. Well, thanks again. Go hack.